Well, good morning or good afternoon, whatever time it may be that you're watching this recording. My name is Joy Klump. Um, I will be presenting my Birding Joy Introduction to Birding presentation. I am a certified master naturalist. I have been a certified master naturalist for eight years now. And birding is a passion of mine, and I felt very strongly about creating a safe space for people that were interested in birding that have either very minimal experience or no experience at all. Uh, I can recognize and acknowledge that when you're learning something new, it can be very overwhelming, it can be uh, intimidating. And I really wanted to just kind of create an opportunity for people that were interested in this hobby uh, to just have a good place that they can feel uh, accepted and, and comfortable with asking questions and just learning. And um, we're going to go over quite a bit of information in this presentation. This presentation was originally done as an in-person class. Um, through the uh, support of the Woodlands Township. And um, so there were some, there's some things that may not necessarily transfer over to a virtual world like our outdoor portion, but hopefully you will be able to gain some information and knowledge that can set you on the right path to uh, beginning this hobby. This is an overview of the things that we're going to discuss today, starting out with an extremely brief uh, history of birding, and I do mean brief. Uh, there is actually so much information that um, you can learn about with just like how we got here in modern day bird watching terms. Uh, but I just highlighted a few key um, time frames uh, just for interest. Uh, there's a book uh, called Of a Feather, which is a, a brief history of American birding, and I encourage you to pick it up if you're a history buff or if not, which I'm not. Um, I think you'll find it really interesting. It, it gives a, a very full picture of um, just how this uh, hobby and interest or just ornithology and bird watching, how it's transformed over many, many years. The next thing I want to be sure and talk about is birding ethics. I've been to quite a few different birding walks and classes, and unfortunately, I've, I've not had anybody that actually addresses this. And, you know, maybe it's that they feel like because we're already birders and kind of into it that they don't need to talk about it, but I feel like it's important to stress it and just refamiliarize yourself with birding ethics, uh, what is um, appropriate for when we are out birding. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The next thing that I want to go over is the term ornotherapy. I was looking for a way to be able to express to people like what birding is to me personally. And in my attempts to do some research of finding out, you know, how I can best describe what birding does for me and my well-being, I actually came across ornotherapy. It's a thing which I didn't know about and it's pretty cool. So we're going to talk about like what it is and how you could actually incorporate uh, practicing, practicing this into your everyday birding interactions. Uh, next, we're going to go over ID characteristics, which is what well, I'm sure your majority of you are here is to kind of understand what to look for and what that process looks like in IDing a bird. Um, in conjunction with that, we'll discuss some suggested supplies and materials. I'm going to go over very briefly on some of my favorite apps that I use. We'll talk a little bit about field guides. Um, and then that'll basically wrap it up because clearly we can't do an outdoor portion of the class um, virtually. But I do hope that maybe in the future, I can schedule some bird walks uh, for our new beginners and we can just go out and have some fun and, and practice what you've learned in this, this class. So first up is my very, very, very brief history of birding. Um, 1827, if you're not familiar with who 
John James Audubon is, um, he was, he's con was considered or is considered pretty much the father of ornithology. And he created some massive volumes of work that eventually just came, became the birds of America. The picture that you see here on the screen is a, a sample of the artwork that is included in this um, collection. And it wasn't really like for field guide purposes. It was more of just a way to um, chronicle the different species that uh, he was coming in contact with. Uh, it was very extensive, but I will say if you ever get an opportunity to look at a copy of Birds of America, um, the artwork is pretty amazing. 1880, uh, bird feathers became very fashionable. Uh, the reason I included this is because this action actually helped to <laughs> unfortunately decimate many, many populations of birds. And so it really just, um, it affected uh, bird populations in a, greatly in, an, in a negative way, obviously. Um, there was a, there were some people or a, a, a woman, I believe, that was actually influential in trying to kind of turn around the mindset of using feathers in fashion. Um, and it eventually kind of became a little bit more taboo to where uh, they were not they were not being used in fashion as much. Uh, 1889, Florence Merriam publishes Birds Through an Opera Glass. And the reason I included this is because, um, first off, the my ornithology and kind of just the birding world as a whole in the very beginnings was very much a male-dominated world. And so uh, I really wanted to highlight the, the work and the effort that Florence Merriam put into um, producing this book because... She actually was one of the first to suggest using opera glasses to view birds. And so it was almost kind of like a predecessor to our now binoculars. Um, so it, it made a, a big impact in, in a bird, birding world. Uh, 1900 was the first Christmas bird count. Um, Frank Chapman was uh, an ornithologist who um, tried to advocate for changing a tradition where many people would go out um, every year and they would have this contest of who could kill the most birds. You see, back in those times, uh, it was very difficult to study bird specimens. And so unfortunately, a lot of times they would just kill the bird to be able to study it closer. And so um, Frank Chapman's um, promotion of a Christmas bird count really kind of changed the attitude and the mindset of kill first. Um, and so he actually turned it around into more of like a contest to see, hey, instead of killing all these birds, let's uh, count them, uh, which actually produced quite a bit of useful data for people to uh, collect and review. So, and this still goes on today. So if you're ever interested in participating in a Christmas bird count, it, it happens to this day every year. So it's pretty cool. Um, and then we're skipping way, way into the modern day. Um, and basically just to make a point that from its infancy of like early beginning stages of ornithology and bird watching, we're now into a multi-billion dollar activity. Anything from purchasing bird seed and bird feeders and bird baths and um, t-shirts and home decor, gift cards, ecotourism is a huge uh, uh, gener money generating activity that is uh, surrounding um, bird watching. And people travel all over the world for this activity. And so it has a, a great impact on tourism and, and generating um, influx of, of money into those areas that are known for being birding hotspots. So 
it's it's come a long way over the course of many many years and of course with telling um talking about uh, birding i wanted to be sure and include um, a rundown a brief rundown on ethics because it's very important to keep this in mind when going out and birding at any point in time um, the first one, this is based off American Birding Association's Code of Ethics, or the ABA for short. Uh, first one is respect and promote birds and their environment. This is basically um, just stating to uh, engage in, in uh, and promote bird-friendly practices whenever possible. This would include keeping cats and other domestic animals indoors, um, helping to reduce uh, window strikes if you have a problem with birds hitting your windows, um, maintaining clean feeding stations, which is huge. And last year we ended up, at least in this area, um, and actually many parts were affected by this, but um, we had an outbreak of salmonella and it really affected um, some bird populations and one way that um, we, you know, the, the birding community tried to combat that was by encouraging people to please either just take their bird feeders in for a few weeks or make sure that they're cleaning them uh, rigorously and frequently uh, to help prevent the spread of, of salmonella, which was greatly affecting the bird species. And uh, here, at least primarily, it, it hit pine siskins really hard for some reason. Um, landscaping with native plants. Um, this is great because it provides a natural food source for birds, which over time they've evolved with these plants to, to use them as food sources. And so it's always a great benefit to plant native if you can. And then uh, just being able to promote and um, support businesses that also participate in and advocate for uh, sustainable practices just within their company. Um, the sh uh, shade grown bird friendly coffee. I think there's even um, a maple syrup company now that is uh, promoting that they practice a bird friendly um, self, uh, sus sustainable practices within their business. Um, and so just making those small changes just in your everyday life can, can really uh, um, promote the, the first code of ethic. Um, another, another concept of, of this particular, um, code of ethic is uh, being sure that you are not stressing birds out when you are going out birding. So um, being very careful around active nests, uh, limiting the use of the bird recordings, because this is primarily important during like spring migration or during mating and nesting periods, um, because it can actually alter the behavior that the bird would naturally be um, acting on. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, the next one is respect and promote the birding community and its individual members. This is a big one for me because um, I think it's really important that as you grow in your skills as a birder, um, to keep in mind that we all started from, we all had a beginning. And so if you can be sensitive to that when other new beginning birders are coming into the scene to just um, have patience and be willing to answer questions and share the wealth of information that you've gained over the years, um, it's really helping to uh, promote those, those individual members rather than creating an environment where, um, you know, you're pointing out that they don't know as much as you or whatever. Um, also, um, sharing your observations f f freely and making sure that if you do report your observations, that they are um, as true and accurate as possible. Um, the third 
And last one is respect and promote the law and the rights of others. Uh, this is a, a, another big one, big important one as well. Um, don't ever enter private property if you're birding unless you have the landowner's permission. Um, one example that I can think of with respect to this particular ethic is a quite a few years ago, I think it was about 2016, there was a, a hawk owl that uh, visited a part of uh, Washington state. And of course, word got around in the birding community. Uh, this hawk owl was hanging out on somebody's private property and all these people started congregating to get a view of this really cool rare bird. And so even though the birders were on public land, public property, they were taking photos and recordings of someone's private house and their private property. And it really disturbed the homeowner and a homeowner tried to plead with the individuals of, Hey, you know, I don't mind if you're looking at the bird, but please don't use cameras. Don't use you know video or whatnot because this is, you know, my house. Uh, and I'm guessing that that was not really respected or heard through the community as a whole. And unfortunately, the birding community got a horrible shock um, when they went out to observe this bird again, and it was hanging dead upside down in the tree. So I will let you draw your own conclusions from that. I believe that they are still investigating that. I, I don't recall hearing an update about what was found out about that. Um, but it, it just, it, it actually really kind of opened the eyes to many people in the birding community to kind of self-reflect and, and ask, like, did we, did we cause this? Was it out of our own actions? And was this preventable? So good thing to keep in mind when you're out birding is just be aware of your surroundings and make sure that if you are on private property, you always have the permission of the um, homeowner or the landowner. Um, this next little segment is all about um, ornotherapy. And again, this was something that I wanted to include in my presentation because birding is a very personal thing to me. It's helped me in my life, just my overall well-being. Um, I think the last year has put everybody in high stress. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really, it's been kind of a lifesaver for me when I feel really down or I'm just really struggling with, um, life <laughs> and adulting, um, I know I can always rely on this interest and hobby um, to kind of recenter. And uh, when I go out birding, I I begin to really see that I'm I'm very very my problems are very small in the grand scheme of things, and it just allows me a different perspective uh, and appreciation of the world. Um. We need nature. We need these connections with nature. It, it's been a scientific proven fact that by spending time outdoors and connecting with nature, that it can actually reduce stress um, and, and help overall just well-being and health in individuals. Um, there are uh, medical practices and organizations that actually try now to incorporate some sort of connection to nature in their own hospitals and um, or nursing facilities uh, because they they recognize that nature can be very healing for for individuals and the act of ornotherapy the the main objective is really to just improve your mindfulness and your observation skills and so oftentimes with birding sometimes you can get caught up on, you know, 
the listing side of things of recording all the different birds that you've seen. And while that can be very fun and challenging and has a, a sensation of a little competitiveness and excitement, um, you know, this being actively engaged in ornotherapy allows you an opportunity to just kind of like put that all aside and just be in the moment and enjoy that time. Um, practicing this when you're going out and birding actually, I feel like helps these interactions with nature to be even more meaningful. And the, the best thing about this is you don't even have to have any birding experience. If you are a brand new burner and you don't even know what any bird is called, you can go out tomorrow and practice um, ornotherapy. Um, this is the unfortunate thing about a virtual class because we can't really go out and participate in the activity. But I would encourage you, if you're interested in this, there is a great book um, called or Ornotherapy. And this is what it looks like. You can see it. It's um, by Holly Merker and Richard Crossley and, and his daughter, um, Sophie. And uh, if you're not familiar with the Crossley name, um, he's synonymous with um, field guides. And so uh, it's, it's just a, a very interesting little book that kind of has a different spin on including birds in your life. And there's some exercises in this book that you can do that's, um, they break it into like explorations, meditations, and journaling. So um, you can pick whatever activity you want to do and take it out there out, outside and, and, and do it and just enjoy your time. But uh, I wanted to be sure and emphasize the fact that Birding doesn't have to just be about um, creating lists, and it, it can be so much more than that. So here we're going to get into um, the the main meat of the presentation: ID characteristics. Um, and I try to keep these very simplistic uh, because there are a lot more details that you can look at on a bird. But if you are brand new, um, that it can be very overwhelming. So I wanted to keep it very, very simple as far as just something to start you out to get to practice looking at um, on on birds. These are basically the pieces of the puzzle. I'm giving you the pieces of the puzzle. And then hopefully with practice, you can go out and you can gather those pieces of the puzzle and put them together to be able to figure out an ID on that particular bird that you saw. So the first one is going to be bills or beaks. You can use that term synonymously. Either one is going to be correct. If you see on this um, picture here in the top left corner, we've got a little picture of, I guess it's either a crow or a raven, and they are considered to have what's called just kind of a generalist uh, bill. This is something that allows them to feed a variety, feed on a variety of different things. Um, the, the thing that's great about looking at um, bills is that this is going to kind of tell you like what the diet of that bird is. Um, and so you'll be able to kind of tell like, is this some, is this a bird that is maybe more of a water bird? and is going to have a, a diet of, of fish or frogs, toads, um, little water organisms of, of sort, or is this more of like a seed eating bird? So looking at the bill can really help you um, draw some information out to help you better identify that bird. The next one to the crow is uh, it, it's an insect catching bird. So if you see that the difference in the, the bill, it's got this very um, pointed, you know, sharp pointed tip to the, the bird. And usually the birds that have this type of bill, you know, they're kind of um, sh shorter bills, um, but they're always going to have some sort of a, a point to them because it's great for catching insects. And it also allows them to 
um, maybe uh, poke in um, tree trunks or, you know, small crevices to, to get those insects. Um, the next one to the right is a grain eating bill. And this is more of kind of like this conical shape bill. Um, great example of this would be our Northern Cardinal um, has kind of that uh, seed eating uh, bill. And the next one is the bill actually does look like that. So this is would be a coniferous seed eating bird. And that is an example of a cross bill. The bill actually really does cross over like that. <laughs> um, going down to like the second row, I'm trying to pick some birds that would be like in our general vicinity, um, which actually that cross bill I don't think would be. But um, the, the next row is uh, the woodpecker there, um, which is the second row and the second bird from the left. Um, that's more of, that's considered more of a chiseling bill. And so it's got this nice, long, very strong bill that helps it poke into tree trunks um, for drawing out all sorts of insects. And let's see, we've got, we've got the pelican next to that, which is dip netting. Um, they come, they go along the water and just kind of like scoop things up. The next one is a surface skimming, which um, that bird is an example of an actual skimmer. And you can see that the bottom of its um, beak is longer than the top. And it's a perfect design for this bird because this bird literally just flies over the surface of the water and puts that bottom part of its beak in the water and just skims the top of the water. Um, next bird would be an example of like a hummingbird, a nectar feeding bird. And then bottom row, the far left raptorial, um, the, those bills are going to be designed with, they're going to be bigger for the most part, because this is going to basically be your birds of prey. Um, they're going to be bigger and they're going to have this very sharp um, point to the end of its bill because it is designed for tearing flesh. Um, so th that's just a few examples there of just um, the different designs of the bills for the, each of these birds um, that can give you some additional information about that bird. So here's a little test. I want, to, I want you to take a minute to uh, look at this bird uh, and look at its bill and figure out if you can determine what this bird might eat. If you see, the bill is kind of uh, a little bit elongated and comes to a point. So this would be a great example of an insect eating bird. This picture is of a vermilion flycatcher and uh, by its name it, itself, the, the flycatcher, it's, uh, it's definitely an insect eating bird. Next example, I'll give you a minute to think about the shape of this bill on this particular bird and what it might be closely related to in that list that we went over. This bill is more of kind of that conical shape. So it would actually be more of a seed eating bird. This is a picture of a painted bunting, which is in the Texas area. Here's a next, our next example. I feel like there should be some like Jeopardy music. Do, 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 do. If you look, you can see that uh, super sharp points. And if uh, if you've seen this bird before, you know it, or you may know, this is a barred owl. It's one of my favorite birds. Love them so much. But take a look at that uh, extremely pointed tip there. It's great for uh, 
tearing at uh, mice, rodents. Um, so that would be more of a raptorial type bill. What about this one? Uh, we didn't really have a specific example on that um, sheet that we looked at earlier. But if you can kind of tell in the background, maybe some context clues. <laughs> that bill, to me, looks very much like a, like a knife or a dagger. It's very strong. But this bird actually uses its bill just like that, like a dagger. And it stands very motionless for minutes upon minutes and waiting for unsuspecting prey to come along. And it uses that bill to just immediately strike and poke um, or, or stab its, its prey, which they have a diet that primarily consists of fish or um, toads, frogs, um, even probably like crawd, craw, crawfish. Uh, but this is a great blue heron, um, which again, we have these all over the place in Texas. So that's kind of more of like a, a dagger-like um, bill. I wanted to talk a little bit about feet. Um, this may not be as important as far as an identification, but it can come into play, not only about the design, but even sometimes the color of the feet will help you uh, determine what bird it is. There are some birds that they're so similar in their appearance, but they may have just the difference of like one might have more pinkish feet and the other might have just all black feet. And so by observing what their feet look like, it can not only tell you um, maybe how the birds types of behaviors, like where they should be, whether they're swimming or wading birds or perching birds or more of um, birds of prey, which are going to be grasping and, and catching, you know, uh, fish and they really need to have strong, big talons. Um, but the color of the feet is important as well. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to ID a bird to not only look at like how the toes are arranged and the, the size of the talons or nails, but look at the color of those feet also. Um, so a few examples that you'll probably see most common in some of, you know, really just like your backyard birds or just most common in this area. You're going to have um, climbing feet, which you, if you can tell uh, there, if you look at the climbing foot versus the perching foot, which is about four down, the climbing foot has two toes in the front and two toes in the back versus the perching foot, which has three toes facing forward and one toe facing back. Now the climbing foot, um, that arrangement is, can, it's referred to as being zygodactyl, where you have the two in the front and two in the back. This is more for like your woodpeckers, because if you've seen a woodpecker, they usually hop along kind of going up and down the side of the tree trunk. So they need that extra stability on that back end to help them kind of sit up against the, the tree trunk. The next one's swimming. So obviously you can see that that is a webbed foot. So that's going to be great for like ducks or other waterfowl that actually, um, you know, spend a majority of their time just in water. Um, I'm going to skip down to the perching foot. You know, as I mentioned before, it's got the three toes in the front and the one in the back. So this is a great design for um, a lot of our songbirds so that they can, when they land on a tree limb, they can grasp that tree limb pretty effectively. Uh, the next one is considered grasping. So this would be more of like your birds of prey, hawks, owls. Um, they tend to have like much stronger um, talons, longer talons also. And the next one is um, scratching, which um, 
you know I mean, they, it gives the example of chickens, but we're talking about more of like, you know, wild birds here. So this might be more of kind of like, um, like your quail, quail species. Next thing you want to consider when trying to ID a bird is your colors and behaviors. And also I, I didn't include it on the slide, but the size of the bird um, may help you kind of determine um, what bird you're looking at as well. Now I've used pictures of a couple birds that we do not have in this area, um, but I just use them more of like an example, exaggerated example because of their uh, bright, vibrant colors. Um, so in the example of the peacock, you know, your your colors are blue and green and white. And isn't it amazing when we see those colors, I think we kind of tend to just automatically think about peacocks anyway, because those colors are so synonymous with that particular bird. The middle bird um, is a picture actually I took while I was in London. But interestingly enough, this bird, this this species of bird has actually made an appearance in the Dallas area in the past. Um, I can't remember what year it was, but it, it made a, um, there was a lot of hype about this uh, Mandarin duck that ended up in da the Dallas area, which they're not supposed to be here, but somehow that little duck found its way over there. Um, but again, look at those colors. They're beautiful. They're vibrant. You've got that kind of rusty, look um, on the head with the buffy white uh, patch there and a little bit of black and then you've even got some blue going on on the wings. Um, so just take some time and practice being able to kind of pinpoint the different colors that you see on the bird. The third photo is a, a picture of a ruby-throated hummingbird which we do have in this area and as you can see it's got this really shiny um, green with that um, that ruby or red throat area, which sometimes, depending on the way that you're looking at a bird, like I don't always see that ruby th throat on the hummingbird until the sun hits it just right. So, you know, keep that in mind too, that sometimes just even moving your position and getting a different look at the bird might actually help you um, see something that you didn't see before. And then in regard to behaviors, um, ask yourself, what is this bird doing? Is it just hanging out in the water? Because that might be a good indication that that bird is primarily kind of a waiting bird. It just tends to stand there in the, in the water waiting for the prey to, to come along. Uh, is it just hanging out in the trees? Uh, that might help you narrow it down to know, oh, okay, well, maybe this is a songbird uh, or some sort of uh, fly catcher or a warbler. Um, is it super high, tall, or hanging out, hanging out at the like, um, top of the tallest, tallest trees? Does it have a larger size? Could be a bird of prey that you're looking at. Um, so asking yourself those kinds of questions can, again, help you get those puzzle pieces so that you can put it all together at the end and um, have an easier time IDing a bird. A location and the time of year are also very important. Um, the location, for example, we have uh, Carolina chickadees here, but uh, there is a black capped chickadee that looks so similar to the Carolina chickadee, but it's not in this area. So if you were to see the chickadee and we're just looking through a book, like let's say you had, you picked up a, a field guide that was just overall field guide for all of the United States, you might have a picture of a black capped chickadee come up and th you might think, oh, well, that's the bird. But it's very, very important to look at the range of those birds. And in most field guides, they're going to have some sort of um, description or a little map that tells you what that range is as far as just overall um, 
uh, average of where this bird hangs out the most. And so if you look at that range map and that bird only is, is shown as being in like Colorado, Wyoming area, then you know, okay, that's, that's not this bird that I'm looking at. I've got to go back to the drawing board and figure out, you know, a, a bird that actually shows up in, in Texas. So it, it's very important to consider the location too when you're purchasing a field guide. Um, so if you're going to be primarily um, birding in Texas, then make sure that the field guides that you're getting uh, are geared towards that area. If you're taking a trip to Costa Rica, get a bird guide that is for Costa Rica. It's a very dramatic <laughs> example in the change there, but I, I think you get my point. And then the time of year, uh, keep in mind, we have two major migration times in the U.S. We've got a spring migration and a fall migration. And so those time periods are going to have the potential of bringing in different birds during that migration time. So if it's in the middle of the summer, you're probably going to have more of like your resident birds that hang out here all the time. But if it's in the springtime and you see a bird that you're really not familiar with, it's very possible it's a migrant. And so um, that's when you have to start really kind of collecting more information to determine like, well, where is this bird coming from? So um, these are a few examples of birds that are within kind of the, the Woodlands, Houston, Conroe area. Um, a few of them are more migratory birds and so that you're not going to see them in this area all the time. But there's a few on this uh, slide that are your everyday residents. So the first bird on the top left, that beautiful red bird, is a summer tanager. This is more of a migratory bird, so it's not here all the time, but they uh, do frequent the, the woodlands area. The one to the immediate right of that tanager is a red-bellied woodpecker. And I have to admit, for the longest time, I never understood why that bird was called red belly because I never would see a red belly on it. Um, to me, it seemed like, you know, it's got this red head. Why is it called a red-headed woodpecker? Well, we actually do have a red-headed woodpecker. They, they look a little different. Um, there's, um, I wish I had put a comparison picture on there, but... Uh, if you do look at the red-bellied woodpecker um, and get a good close-up, a lot of times you can see that little patch of red that's on the belly. And I've noticed that during mating season, it seems like those males really get a vibrant belly. So be looking for that the next time you see a woodpecker on your tree. Uh, the next bird on the right, beautiful bird. I love this bird. It's a uh, rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, and this would be another one of our migratory birds. Um, the bottom row on the left corner, that is a yellow rumped warbler. And uh, this is another kind of migratory bird that comes through the woodlands. And I noticed in the last year, um, man, it seemed like there were a lot that came through. And then uh, next to that is our beautiful northern cardinal. And I'd made a comment in our face-to-face -face class that, uh, you know, we see this bird every single day, but there's people that come from all over the world to, to see this bird. And so when you hear something like that, it really gives you an appreciation um, and a different perspective for something that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's not hard to kind of take this bird for granted, but there are people that have never seen this bird before ever in their lives. And so I think it's kind of neat that we, we have this beautiful bird that we can look at every single day. That's the Northern Cardinal. Next to it is the Blue Jay. Um, Blue Jays are in the um, Corvid family. So they're in there with the crows and ravens. They're extremely smart birds. Uh, I think a lot of people complain about them being bullies, which they can be. Um, but I think they're, they're amazing. And finally, the last one in the bottom right corner is a tufted titmouse. Um, this is a, a everyday resident here in the Woodlands area. 
Um, but this also is a great example of bird uh, of a bird that can look very similar to another bird that uh, isn't really down as far this direction. It's the um, black capped. No, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm having a brain fart. Um, give me just a second, because I am just not remembering. It's the black crested tin mouse. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Could not think of the name. Um, but there's a black crested titmouse. And I, you usually see that more in like the, the hill country. So like kind of the Austin area and everything. But um, they, they look very similar except the black crested titmouse. You see that nice, beautiful crest on that bird. Um, that's usually all black. Um, but this one here is the tufted titmouse. And this is one that we can see every day as well around this area. So this is just a very small um, example of the birds that you can see in and around the woodlands area. But we we have a great variety of birds. Um, we have three species of owls that are kind of a, a, a regular um, lineup. We've got the eastern screech owl. We have great horned owl. We have the barred owl, which is my favorite. Um, common night hawks, chimney sweeps. Uh, as far as the woodpeckers, we also have downy woodpecker. Um, here's an amazing thing if you weren't aware, but our the um, Jones Forest, so the state forest that is right basically your next door neighbor to the the woodlands area, um, has a extremely endangered bird, the red cockaded woodpecker. So it's kind of cool that we have. Um, that bird like basically right next door to us um we've got a red uh, sorry yellow bellied sapsucker which is in that um woodpecker family texas as a whole i think if i remember correctly has uh, at least five different species of hummingbirds that come through and migrate the most popular hummingbird that tends to be most prevalent in this area is going to be your ruby throated hummingbird but we have other species that come through this area during migration time um got white winged doves morning doves the carolina wren is another popular daily visitor um ruby crowned kinglet cedar wax wings uh the american robin mockingbirds, uh, goldfinches, sis pine siskins, and another one that I feel very lucky about is we've got bald eagles here. Like, I think that is so amazing. I never tire of seeing bald eagles. They are so majestic, so beautiful. And the woodlands is home to multiple mating pairs. So I just think that's amazing. Um, so we do have a great variety here uh, in and around the woodlands area uh let's see next up is our suggested supplies and materials and i do want to just uh, emphasize that this is just um a basic list and when you go out birding you take what you feel is com you know is going to make you feel comfortable um it, these are just the the bare essentials i think and you know if you're watching this and and you've you have some other essential supply that I didn't list out. I would love to hear about it. So maybe I can add it to an updated version of this recording. Um, but a field guide is really important. And like I said earlier, make sure that you have a field guide that is designed for the area that you're birding in, because um, that will make a big difference on you being able to identify the birds. A backpack or something to be able to carry all of your stuff. I like to take a notepad and a writing utensil of some sort uh, just in case I'm not able to get to the field guide right away or my phone isn't working or whatnot. I have some way of jotting down some quick notes as to like what that bird looked like so that I can hopefully take it back home later and do some more research. I've got the phone listed uh, mainly because there's all sorts of apps, which we'll go into a little bit later, 
that you can download to your phone, um, which in some respects is great for weight. Um, sometimes those field guides can add a lot of weight to your bag. Um, so, but you know, keep in mind, technology doesn't always work. And so um, if you're in a place where you don't get a good signal or your battery dies, you may not have access to that. That's why I always encourage people to still take a, um, a hard copy of a field guide if possible. Um, or, you know, at least the notepad so you can write down some notes about what that bird looked like. Binoculars are very important as well. And in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about magnification um, in, in a very brief way of kind of picking a, a pair of binoculars that would be right for your style of birding. But I feel like binoculars are kind of a personal choice. And so it's really important to try as, you know, different sets out until you find the one that you think is going to be a good fit for you. They are an investment. And while you can go to Walmart and pick up a pair of Bushnell or, you know, some of those other um, types of binoculars, uh, I also find that you kind of get what you pay for with binoculars, um, just like cameras. And so if you have the ability to really invest in a good pair of binoculars, I encourage you to do so because it does make a huge difference. Um, but just try, try as many out as you can. Um, you, you know, you may find that one set looks great when you're looking through it, but it's really heavy and it's bulky and you don't like that. So um, just practice using a bunch of different variety of, of binoculars if you can. And that goes for um, spotting scopes as well. Um, you know, you just got to find a, a good fit. Um, the little picture to the right of binoculars is supposed to represent a harness. You don't have to have a harness, but I do find that at least having a neck stri strap around helps me where if I have to, to use two hands for something, um, I don't have to like scurry around to try and find some way of, of putting my binoculars up. I've, I can at least see they're, they're on my body by via a neck strap or a harness of some sort. So let's talk about binoculars a little bit. When you go shopping for binoculars, the, 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 there's going to be two numbers that are associated with your optics. Um, so couple examples I have here, 7 by 35, 8 by 42. That first number represents the magnification of um, your binoculars. So how many times closer is that object going to be to you um, wherever you're, you're positioned? So for example, the 7 by 35, that first number, the 7, is representing the magnification. So when I look through those binoculars that are listed as a seven by 35, that item that, or that, sorry, that object that I'm looking at is going to be seven times closer to me. Same thing for the eight by 42. If I'm looking through binoculars that have the magnification of eight, think of it in terms that that object is going to be eight times closer to me. Um, Binoculars generally come in magnification anywhere from like 1 to 12, um, although I did learn recently that you can get uh, binoculars that have a higher magnification. Um, but, you know, 1 to 12 is generally the range. Um, and then once you get past that number, uh, you may want to ask yourself, like, do I want to maintain using binoculars that are a higher magnification or do I want to consider maybe going up to like a spotting scope? Because your scopes tend to pick up about 15 times magnification and go up much, much higher. They are bigger and bulkier. And sometimes when you get a higher magnification of binoculars, they can be a little bit cumbersome as well. So the sweet spot is being able to find high magnification that is still um, portable and, and or compact. Um, sometimes you have to sacrifice one over the other. So this is why I say picking a pair of binoculars is very personal because you got to decide like what's important to you. 
for me, especially with uh, my eyesight changing, what I'm viewing and how I'm viewing it through the binoculars is big for me. Um, I'm not quite at the point where I have to wear my glasses when I look through binoculars. Much of the time I don't, but if you are one that has to wear glasses, then you'll want to consider that when you're buying your binoculars also and like how how it looks and how comfortable is it when you're having to hold it up to your face with your glasses on. Um, so the second number, um, the 35 or in the second example, the 8 by 42, that 42 represents the size of your objective lens. So that is the, if you've got the binoculars up, it would be the, your objective lens is the lens at the at the end. And it's usually I'm sized in like millimeters, I believe. Um, and so that size of objective lens is going to basically be um, what helps the light in the get into the, the binoculars. And so the higher the number, um, generally the more light that is going to be able to come into the binoculars and hopefully give you a brighter image. Um, here we've got an example, and I apologize because it is actually a little bit blurry, but this gives you an example of kind of like the differences in your magnification. Six times magnification on the far left versus 12 times the magnification on the right. And I will say that if you are, for example, just birding in your backyard, or you're, you're fairly close to whatever the object is, you're going to want to consider getting some binoculars that are on the lower end of the magnification. Otherwise, if you get a pair of binoculars that has too much magnification, you're not going to be able to see that bird that is fairly close to you to begin with. You're going to have to find that you, you back up. You have to back up quite a ways to be able to actually view that bird up close. Um, so um, if you're really in endeavoring to um, have a variety of experience in your birding, buy multiple pairs of binoculars. <laughs> Get some that are a lower magnification and some that are a higher magnification um, and, and see if that um, makes your, your birding experience more exciting. Um, we're going to get into apps now. And uh, again, these are just some suggested um, apps that I like to use, um, but this is one of those things I feel like is kind of personal too. So while I'm providing them as suggestions, you may find that they don't work for you and that's okay. Uh, you've got to find something that you're comfortable with using. Um, the first one is eBird and uh, this, they do have an app for your phone but eBird as a whole is really more like, um, I use it a lot for keeping track of my list of birds, my life list. And then um, a lot of citizen science projects will use eBird for data collecting. But eBird is an, is an amazing platform because uh, this is through Cornell University. And this this platform is used for scientific research and purposes. So it's pretty legit. Um, so I really, I really appreciate and, and love having access to this. Um, one example here, if I can actually get the video to run, if you watch the, is it going to go? I hope it's going on your end. <laughs> if it's not, um, basically what it's supposed to be showing is the the change, the migration change. This is an example of painted bunting, and it shows the relative abundance or of, of the populations moving from, you know, Central America there, um, all up through Mexico and into Texas. And they they hit Texas kind of around the May June July time period. And then you can watch it just go back down towards the end of the year. Um, like I said, I can't tell if that video is actually showing 
on your end. So I apologize about that. But this is just some some of the information that you can get right off of eBird. So it's pretty cool just to be able to spend some time kind of searching around. Um, the next one is Merlin Bird ID. I love this app. This is one of my favorites. It makes it so easy um, to be able to kind of uh, pinpoint what bird you could be looking at. It's free. Uh, it does take some active participation on your part. Uh, another thing that I love about this app is it has a song ID component to it. So if you're out in the middle of a forest, uh, you can actually uh, hit the song ID and record the, the sounds that you're hearing. And the app will actually attempt to ID the birds just from that sound recording. It's, it's super cool. Uh, it's not 100% accurate. Uh, because I used it, I don't know, I guess it was last month uh, over at Huntsville State Park, and and it was uh, telling me that there was a loon in the forest, um, which it wasn't a loon. So uh, you have to kind of be careful with it. <laughs> but I still think that it's a pretty cool um, aspect to the app. Uh, it also makes it very easy for you to input the, the active participation part of it comes from, it asks you certain questions like, what's the date? Where are you located? What's the size of the bird? Uh, you can input up to three different colors. Um, you can tell it what the behavior is of that bird. So basically everything that I just went over on the ID characteristics or so, it, that's what you're going to have to be inputting into this app. And then it'll give you a list of the birds uh, that it thinks that may be what you're looking at. Um, so, but remember, you know, just make sure that you keep in mind it's not always 100%. iBird Pro is another very popular uh, bird ID app. They do have a light version, which is free, but then they're more all-encompassing uh, app is got, it has a cost. Um, this app has photos and drawings and it also includes audio so you can hear the songs and the calls of the bird but the thing that's neat about this particular app is it also will uh, attach like it'll show you similar sounding birds too. So that's always helpful when you have two birds that maybe look very similar but might have different calls. Um, that's pretty handy. The next one is Audubon Bird Guide. This is a really great uh, app. It's free and it also has kind of a function with uh, that's kind of like the eBird thing where it'll tell you, uh, you can actually mark that you've seen a bird in a certain area and then you can also kind of look for er uh, birds in the area, which once you get more familiar with eBird, um, that'll that'll make more sense to you. But it's you can kind of you can list your birds that you see, or you can actually locate birds based off of um, geographical area. And Larkwire is not really like a bird; it's not a bird identification app. But I wanted to include this because this is a great little platform. Um, because it kind of makes practicing a game. And so it will give you a bunch of different pictures and different songs, and you can actually practice your identification skills. I uh, can't remember. I think they might have a free version, um, but there is a cost to this one. So just keep that in mind. And one other thing that I want to be sure and uh, pinpoint that someone brought up in our face-to-face -face class, at least with Merlin ID, there are different bird packs. They call them bird packs in the, in the actual app that you can download based on the location that you are. So uh, you keep that in mind when you use that app, because first of all, you want to make sure that you download the correct bird pack to your app. So if you're going to be birding in North America, make sure that you you download the North America bird pack. Or I think you might even be able to um, just download the Texas bird pack or something. It, it's been a while since I've done it. So, but just uh, be aware of that 
when you download the actual set of birds that you want it to draw from, because that can make a difference in how it's IDing your bird. Um, oops, I went a little too advanced. So this um, this was actually something that we did in our outdoor portion of the class when we met face to face. But I do want to go ahead and highlight it in our virtual recording here. Um, I listened to a radio show, show called Ray Birds Talking Bird, or Ray Brown's Talking Birds, and um, they help emphasize a, a concept called go plurting. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term plogging, but this was something that kind of had a, a big movement over started in Sweden where. Um, this movement of individuals that would go jogging um, started to pick up trash while they were jogging. And so they called it plogging. Um, and so this is something that's very similar uh, with the with plurting is it's basically picking up trash while you're birding. And, you know, I think as stewards of our our wildlife and and our land we should be um you know trying to find ways that we can give back and so you know if you're out there enjoying watching these beautiful birds that are in your area i mean the least that we can do is try to collect some of the trash that's in the area right so um some of the examples of just things to try and watch out for a fishing line is always a big one um balloons uh, I added like confetti on there because uh, I still find that people go out, especially around Easter time and um, do those confetti things. And so you get all these little shiny pieces of plastic. Um, and then of course, plastics, anything that's plastic, we really need to try and, and get up out of the, the ground. And uh, so uh, this is just a, a fun thing to, to kind of make you aware of that, um, you know, when you're out birding, try to kind of pay more attention to your surroundings, not just about the birds that are in the area, but if you can possibly pick up any trash um, while you're doing it. And if you happen to participate in this activity, be sure to look up Ray Brown's Talking Birds show. And I think they have a hashtag that you can upload photos to if you're um, if you participate in the activity and they have an awesome little patch that they can send you if um, you get really serious about it so yeah it's fun fun little thing um hopefully this will work uh based off of the recorded presentation but these are three qr codes that i wanted to be sure and include um, I know there were some people when I did the face-to-face -face class that were interested in doing native, or, sorry, um, how, how to attract more birds to their yards. And so I actually had just done a, a class on creating bird-friendly spaces. And maybe in the future, I will record a presentation on that as well. But in the meantime, I wanted to be sure and provide a great native plant list that you can take a look at. Um, and then the the next QR code is uh, basically gardening for wildlife or planting for birds. So it gives you a few little tips on how to plant to encourage that wildlife to come into your yard. And then the third one is uh, Red Start's Birding Optics Guide. Red Start is a, a, a birding optics uh, company, and they put out an optics guide every single year. So this QR code will actually take you to the 2021 version. It's quite extensive. Of course, they they um, include a bunch of um, other information in it, but they usually have a very good review of multiple models and brands of optics. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you are interested in uh, investing in your first set of binoculars or even if you're interested in upgrading. And then finally, I want to just be sure and highlight uh, a few organizations and just give a shout out and thanks. Um, if you're watching this again from having attended the face-to-face -face, uh, class, then you know that I had a few little goodies to give away in the classroom, which included 
a back copy for Bird Watchers Digest. I love this publication. It's not just about like focused on bird watching per se, but they include a whole bunch of different information about just birds in general and even like current events and things that are happening in and around the world about um, things that are affecting bird populations. And so it's a very um, well-rounded uh, publication. And uh, if you're not so big on actual physical magazines, they do have a digital version as well. And I think that subscription is a little um, more economical if you want to go the digital route. Uh, but they actually donated m uh, multiple copies of a back issue for the class. And so I just want to be sure and, and thank them for that wonderful donation. Same thing with Birds and Beans. They are the only one, I believe, in the U.S., the uh, only company, a coffee company that has all uh, sustainable practices within their um, company in producing shade-grown bird-friendly coffee. And this company um, was very generous. I asked them if they would consider donating some coffee for me to give out to the attendees, and they actually ended up sending almost like there was 12 ounce bags. I thought it was only going to get little, little samples, but um, they were a total class act in providing some wonderful samples of coffee to the attendees. And so I just want to be sure and thank them for that donation. It was above and beyond what I would have even expected. Um, Ray Brown's Talking Birds. Again, I mentioned this earlier, great uh, radio show if you can catch it live. Otherwise, uh, check out the podcast version. Uh, like I said, I always I always learn something new when I listen to the show. Um, so want to thank him because I've I've talked with him and um, he was uh, very supportive of helping me um, incorporate the plurting into the face to face class and um, sent me a bunch of the little patches to to give to the attendees and so um thank you ray for for that and then last but not least i want to thank the woodlands township um, for helping to support this class and i hope that in the future we can do many more uh bird educational type uh classes for the residents of the woodlands or in this case where i have a virtual recording maybe it'll reach even more individuals uh, so this is me. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I do have an Instagram account uh, under Birding Joy. And then that's my email. I'm always, I always welcome questions. Uh, if you have photos of birds that you want to send and you need help IDing, I would love to get those photos. If you have questions over anything that you saw in this presentation, again, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to um, answer those questions. And you know, if I don't know the answer, I'll be happy to research it so we can learn together. Um, that's the one thing that I just really love about birding. And it's, I learn something new every day about birding. And it really helps to um, keep my curiosity of the world alive. So um, that's it for Birding Joy. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you learned something. Feel free to email me and give me some feedback. If there was something that wasn't included in this recording uh, or the presentation itself and you would have really liked to have seen it, I'd love to hear your feedback. Otherwise, 